evening, everyone, and welcome to our live broadcast of Teach Today Q&A, sponsored by the Tony Jennings Exceptional Education Institute at the University of Central Florida. We are broadcasting live this evening over YouTube and Facebook. I am your moderator, Dr. Deshaun Chapman. I am the Education Programs Manager in the Center for Higher Education and Innovation at the University of Central Florida. Tonight's presentation is Social and Emotional Learning in an Online Environment. It is the fourth in our series of five sessions of Teach Today Q&A. If you have any questions concerning tonight's topic, go ahead and type it into the comments and we will make every attempt to address it tonight. If we don't get to your question, send us an email at tjeei at ucf.edu and we will respond separately. A quick disclaimer, as we answer questions tonight, please be aware that the responses are the panelists' views and do not necessarily reflect the views of the Tony Jennings Exceptional Education Institute. Now, I would like to introduce our panelists. Dr. Marissa Macy teaches at the University of Central Florida. Her research is related to young children with disabilities, including authentic assessment of children zero to eight with delays or disabilities, developmental screening, play, and personnel preparation. Dr. Suzanne Martin has served for 17 years as a professor and assistant dean of education at the University of Central Florida and has over 35 years of teaching experience at the K-12 and higher education levels. She was named one of the top 25 teachers um, in the state of Florida in 2012. She currently directs a federally funded program titled the National Urban uh, Special Education Leadership Initiative. Dr. Wanda Wade is at the University of Texas Permian Basin campus. She works to ensure teacher preparation programs integrate contemporary technology solutions as a means for training, mentoring, coaching, and the evaluation of both student teachers and those transitioning into their initial classrooms. Her primary research focuses on the virtual coaching model an innovative and sustainable mentoring, coaching, and evaluation model that utilizes online and mobile technology to discreetly and unobtrusively provide immediate feedback on teaching techniques. Dr. Martha Lou Stewart is a professor in the School of Teacher Education in the Exceptional Education Program at UCF. She was the first African-American female promoted to the rank of full professor at UCF. She also serves as the program coordinator of the Supporting High Needs Population Certificate. Additionally, she is the lead researcher on a state-funded grant designed to address preventative strategies in decreasing situational environmental circumstances that impede the growth and development of young African-American males. Ms. Cami Berry is a 19-year veteran educator who has taught grades 4 through 12. She's passionate about her work and making sure education is equitable for all students and teachers. Currently, she works as an instructional coach and 8th grade ELA teacher with both face-to-face -face and online classes. So, panelists, welcome. Thank you for being here tonight. As I stated previously, our topic is social and emotional learning in an online environment. We have a few pre-submitted questions that we will begin with. So let's go ahead and get started. For our first question, let's think big picture. What is social and emotional learning or SEL and why is it important? So I'd like to begin the conversation uh, as to why I think it's important. Christine, if you can, if you pull up that first slide as to what our definition is, please. If not, I can continue to talk about it and I'll know. Go to the next one, please. The definition. And keep going. The definition, that's it. That's it. There we okay. go. Let's make it a little bit large if you can, and I think we can all unpack that. 
So the the working definition, colleagues and 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 families, and those of you who are here of social and emotional learning that most of us are familiar with as we try to impact, uh, unpack, it's a process. It's a process which all young people and adults acquire uh, and apply the knowledge, skills, and attitudes uh, to develop. And there are some key words that we need to talk about. Healthy identities, especially uh, in this climate, uh, how one is able to manage his or her emotions and how one's able to achieve personal and collective goals, uh, feeling and showing empathy for others, how even in such a time as this, we can maintain supportive relationships and how we can help each other, including ourselves, to make responsible and caring decisions. What say you colleagues about that definition? Does that make sense? Martha, I think that makes great sense. And I think we've probably been doing a lot of that work for years, particularly with some of our children and, and young people that have um, different kinds of abilities. And so I think what we really want to concentrate on what's changed across the years since I've been doing this is to think about health and welfare and poverty and all those other uh, pieces that fall onto children and families that can make it challenging to have a balanced social emotional learning. Hi, everybody. I love this working definition. Uh, thank you for, for uh, sharing it with us. And the words that really jump out for me is establish and maintain supportive relationships. I think that's beautiful. Uh, relationships with uh, adults and familiar caregivers and peers. And uh, it's beautiful, well, well written. So let's take a step a step closer um, and put this definition in context, right? So in the state of Florida, are there SEL standards in place? Well, Dr. Chapman, I'm not sure how to answer your question, but I can say if we look at some of the federal laws that support all children, like the Every Student Succeeds Act, there's information in that bill that would be helpful, I think, for people to think about. It talks about the, the best way to measure social emotional learning and um, it identifies some tools and some resources that we might want to use. <clears throat> and I definitely think given today's um, climate of everything that's going on just in the world in general, that these have really been pushed to the forefront. And so, you know, you know, now everyone is really is really needing to be knowledgeable and having some really hands-on strategies because, you know, these basic things, these foundational things, you know, having empathy, you know, making good decisions, having solid relationships, all of that has just been put on hold. So you know, having having resources, I think it's just really, really uh, a key and critical time right now. And all districts are going to be forced um, really, you know, some sooner than than later to really look at this because we can't just go back to what it was without addressing some of the things that all of our kids um, and everybody is go is really going through right now. You talked about building relations. And I'm, I'm, oh, go ahead, please. Cammy, I was going to say here in, in Seminole County, um, we have um, initiated um, social emotional learning as a part of it's a separate curriculum, but it has to be a part. It's it's been, I guess I wouldn't say mandated, but it's been required, I guess, for our schools to have social emotional le lessons at least once a week because of a lot of the um, things that have happened within the past few years within our county with our students. Um, we've had a lot of, we've had, I wanna, that I am aware of probably about three or four um, deaths, um, suicides um, by our teens. And so this, this um, training or learning 
has to come to the forefront. We as teachers also have to take um, a course, you know, suicide prevention, bullying, and all that sort of thing. And so all of that encompasses um, within the social emotional learning. So I'm not sure if there's actual standards, but we here in Seminole County are, are incorporating that within, you know, our um, our um, frameworks. And I'd like to add on to that, if you don't mind, um, part of part of this whole conceptual framework I learned and and we too are learning about it. It's called long term success, lifetime outcomes. And I and I pull these numbers up from the U.S. Department of Education. Like in in 2015 to 2016, nearly 200,000 kids were placed in in school suspension, down from 400,000 in 2011 to 12. Out of school suspension, over 156,000 in 2015 2016, down from over 309,000 in 2011 2012. There's something that has to be done about those issues. And we hope that social emotional learning will, will play a key role in doing something with these data. Absolutely. Something that um, I feel a few of you have mentioned is relationship building and building empathy. And um, it seems a little bit easier to do that when you're face to face with your students. So can we talk a little bit about the difference um, in SEL when you're in the classroom versus when you're doing remote learning? Making a whole lot of I difference. I can speak to that. Go, go. I said, I can speak to that because I'm doing that um, as, I mean, this year. I'm ha I have about 21 students um, in front of me face to face and I have seven um, to 10 students online I'm teaching at the same time. And so it is um, very difficult, I would say, to get the students who are online to actually communicate. You try to involve them within the classrooms. However, um, it's very difficult for them to communicate um, when they are at home, they have may have other distractions. Um, and so with our um, SEL lessons, it's like, you know, if you don't feel comfortable um, with your camera on, please type in the chat box and that sort of thing. But those students, um, they seem a little bit more disconnected um, because they are at home. Um, rather than the ones that are in the classroom who have that social um, interaction with people. And um, I'm not saying that remote learning is, is, is bad, but um, I do feel that um, there could be different, more different alternatives to that so that way we can get those students involved more, uh, much more within the classroom. You brought up a great, the, the context is perfect, teaching online and face-to-face -face at the same time. Does anyone else, um, are you able to add some strategies that teachers can use when they're doing that, when they're online and face-to-face -face at the same time, or if they're just online? Um, what I have used is I try to, um, I incorporate all my students into one use a randomizer when I, when I call on students. So that way the students who are online, they also will be called on during class. Um, I also have started doing stations in my ELA class and I have a laptop at each of the students' desk. And so a student who is online is also paired with a student who is face-to-face. -face. Mm -hmm. And so they get that mm -hmm. communication with the students so that way they can, you know, still have that interaction. It's not just me talking to them all the time, but the students do. I try to have the students talk to each other, um, whether they're online or in the classroom. You know, one of the things that kept coming up while I was reading, and it was even in the newspaper, and I thought, wow, this must be working. I have a picture of a kindergarten teacher that has made a feelings wheel and she, that's how she starts every day. And that came up in, in academic pieces. It came up in really everyday newspaper pieces. So I think if you can find a way to start your day, to start your lesson, 
that everybody can judge themselves. Everybody, I shouldn't have said judge. That's not what I meant. Everybody can say to themselves and to their friends if they're comfortable how they're feeling. Because if we can kind of gauge their feelings, we can work from there in a number of different ways with a number of different activities. But but Cami, that is so challenging to me. I'm, I'm sitting here trying to figure out how you have seven, 10 people online and 21 people in front of you. That's that's really, really challenging. I'm curious what other people are gonna say. Another strategy that I, I learned from a teacher is called a peace area where we're in our classroom that she established a peace area space in the classroom where a student is able to go to cool down, to regroup, et cetera. Mm -hmm. But another point that I'd like to bring about is to talk about what school means to so many children and so many families. And that is school is a safety net. Um, some children don't feel safe at home for so many reasons. We know of so many children being raised by grand families and grandparents, and they too need support. They too need a champion. And so I think that we need to talk about who's at home working and helping with the, helping the students as they try to navigate this new online learning. It's a great point. I have a, that is a great point. I have a little uh, uh, piggyback off of that. Uh, in early childhood, we say sometimes, uh, Maslow before Bloom. <laughs> and in other words, uh, take care of the basic needs first, like food, shelter, right. secure, uh, safe place. Uh, and, and then we can get to the academics. And I think with social emotional learning, if a child feels secure and safe, uh, that's a starting point. It's about building building community, isn't it? Whether it's a, whether it's a community outside of the school a, a building a classroom community where each child feels valued, feels respected, and, and feels that he or she will have the opportunity to just be a child. And that is some, some of the issues that we have in some of our schools and some of our classrooms. And some of the things, oh, what you've said is just so fabulous because it makes me think of, if, if someone says, how do you feel, Suzanne, that's that makes such a difference to me as a person. And when I think of of children, sometimes they just need a minute to just take a break. So a lot of times I taught kindergarten and first grade, Marissa, I bet you didn't know that, but I did. And what we used to do is we would take a one minute moment. And sometimes we would do an exercise. Sometimes we put heads on the desk. Sometimes we would have a one minute conversation with someone else. It's just letting them regroup and gather. And particularly since what Dr. Stewart was saying, that they don't have gathering places now. They don't have places that are their own, that are safe, where they always have food and protection. So I think that's one of the critical pieces we're facing right now. Wanda, you're shaking your head at me. What do you think? <laughs> um, yeah, just to piggyback off of, of what the group has, has been talking about, you know, I think that that mental piece, that mental aspect of it, um, both, you know, with the online piece, very stressful, you know, a lot of kids lot in the home, a lot of people are online, um, you know, at one time, a lot of extra things going on, you know, and then, you know, the same thing with those teachers that are, that are actually back in the classroom, um, you know, the stresses that are happening in there. I mean, so I just, you know, these are the things, you know, that we really need to try and, and hone in on, um, you know, because they're going to happen. So what is it that we can do to really help, you know, address those and then include, include, you know, a lot of these things that we're talking about, these, mm -hmm. these basic things of just human decency, you know, just a step, because we, at, at times, whether we're virtual or whether we're in person, we are the safe haven. So, you know, how is it, you know, opening those lines of communication? You know, I text with my kids all the time, um, you know, because, you know, they need somewhat of an outlet to, to you know, to be able to, um, you know, to have that outlet. You know, it used to be I could sidebar them in person. Now, you know, it's like, hey, if, if you need something, you know, you know, text me, email me, let, you know, let me know. I, I know it's difficult. I can't see you, but, you know, I'm still, you know, I'm still available. So, you know, having to kind of lean on that technology side 
but still building that relationship with, with our kids and, and reassuring them that those avenues of, of communication, um, yes, we're not face to face. And, you know, at some point this will come to an end, but making sure that, making sure that we, we, we address that and, and make sure those kids know, the, know those things. Dr. Wade, I feel like you took the words right out of my mouth. As you all were speaking, I was thinking, man, they really humanize education, right? And I'm hearing themes about starting with the check-in, assessing where students are emotionally um, before asking them to engage in academic tasks and to prioritize community building. And I think that some teachers just instinctively do that. Mm -hmm. Others rely on a supplementary curriculum like Ms. Barry mentioned. Um, but for those who are in neither of those groups or those who want to integrate SEL into their lesson plans, what are some strategies that they can use to do so? Dr. Martin, I heard you mention earlier about the one minute moment. You know, what are some practical things that teachers can add to their plan? Well, I used that one minute moment in graduate classes, Deshaun, just because well, I could see the fatigue. And that's another word I saw when I was reading compassion fatigue. I never really thought about that. And, and I think that's what happens to a lot of us. It happens to families. It happens to teachers. It happens to children. And until you hear that word, it's like, wow. So I think a couple things, we used to have some time out because that's what people would say, time out. But time out in my room was a really good thing. You worked hard to get time out because you got to go sit in a great big chair and look at a book or a magazine or something that I brought in just pure pleasure. And so I think you just have to kind of build in. I used to use signs with my little ones that would pop up on their desk and it would be, I need a break or I, I didn't understand that. And if they put up red, then I knew to stop. If they put up green, I knew we could keep going. And I would say to them, I don't see any signs. What should I do? And little ones love that to begin with. But, you know, I did it with seventh, eighth and ninth graders that were labeled as having severe emotional problems and they loved it. So it's it's just I think being I love that you said it's humanizing it and it's the it's the compassion we we have to share but we have to share it with each other we have to share it with our families and we have to recognize there's fatigue involved in all of this because there's so much going on mm -hmm. another strategy that I've read about and that I've used is called the icebreakers for example if you're a color what color would you be or if you're a superpower, what superpower would you choose? <laughs> and strength-based, for example, if you had one wish, what would you wish that for? After you do that check-in in the morning and then start checking in with people's feelings and making them feel so good about themselves. Can I just add that I think that we're talking about students, but as Dr. Martin said, self-care yeah. is mm -hmm. so important during this time. Yeah. I thought about a phrase, physician, heal thyself that we have to remember that teachers, educators, parents, grand families are human beings themselves. So support systems during this time for both the child, the learner and the teacher are critical. Critical. Yeah. Um, I, I know this is this is one of um, a strategy that, that I am using at the moment, um, which is really outside of the box is the, the use of a therapy animal. Um, so I do have a therapy dog um, named Lenny. He does accompany me to the STEM school. And, you know, initially he was working to, initially he was working to do a lot of different things, but in that, under that social emotional learning, um, he's really been able to be a catalyst for developing things like empathy, responsibility. Good. Um, you know, he, um, so, I mean, he's really been able to be like a walking, living example of, um, you know, these are the things that you have to do. Um, in addition to that, it's also myself and all the other, the teachers and students around that are, you know, doing things like coaching the students, you know, modeling, you know, mm -hmm. role playing, using, using Lenny as, as a key, as a key player and all of that. So, you know, granted, it's not the most, um, it, it's not talked about yet, um, but the impact of having, you know, an, uh, um, a therapy animal around and involved in, you know, involved in the lesson planning. Lenny's now, 
working with um, second graders on reading fluency. And so he will be incorporated into lesson plans. Now, I know that's not you know your traditional and I can't bring him to wherever you are. Um, believe me, if I win the lottery, I will be more than happy to bring him. Um, but again, you know, there are there are uh, thinking outside of the box and, and thinking on the other side of um, the self care for the teachers. You know, he's been a great, great, you know, relief and anxiety and stress reducer for everybody across the board. So, granted, it's it's not your your everyday um, your everyday type of strategy, but there are programs out there, and I'd be more than happy to um, get gather a list of those and, and put those so that. You know, you know, what do they have in Seminole? What do they have in Orange? What do they have um, in, I forget what's over there by, um, I see left. but Cocoa Beach, but you know, well, I can definitely put that together make sure you, there's, there's access to reach out to those as well. Thank you, Ms. Barry. I think you were trying to jump in. Yes, I was going to say um, a strategy or what we can incorporate in your lesson plans is a restorative practice circle. We've started doing that um, at um, my school. Um, normally it's for like behaviors and discipline, but we've started using it as a check-in with the students and have the students be accountable, to, you know, with each other, you know, saying that, okay, what are some things that are going on with you? Um, what are some, you know, some highs, some lows? And what I do in my class is um, we can't, no, we, well, we try to social distance as much as possible. But um, within our individual groups, we have, you know, where what's one of your positives for today? You know, if you don't have a positive, what can we help you with with the negative, you know, that's going on in your life? And so make, I have eighth graders, so they are um, able to communicate with each other because they're all friends. And I have them choose like an accountability partner within their within the class. So that way, let's say, for instance, some one student is having a struggle with something. They say, Miss Barry, can we go and talk? They go to the in the corner of the room and they can talk to each other because the students have to learn how to to be open and to share um, mm -hmm. instead of keeping things all in. Mm -hmm. So I allow things like that in my classroom because I don't want things, I mean, just like adults, we like to keep stuff in, you know, and that's stressful to us. That's why we have gray hairs. Um, but um, but to I want the students to start learning not to keep things plugged, I mean, inside, but to let them out and to um, just to talk, to talk it out so they can get um, issues and like that solved. And so that's what we do. One of the things that we also do is restorative practice circles. Dr. Chapman? Yes. Uh, what, one thing I was thinking of in a lesson plan that would be uh, helpful is purposefully uh, designing opportunities for social interactions, ah. whether it's virtual or face-to-face. -face, but I think that we want that and need that so much. And it can be hard in a virtual remote situation. Uh, but just like if we were in a classroom, we might have cooperative learning groups or uh, think pair shares or things that are uh, with dyads or small mm -hmm. groups. And there's ways to do that with online also, like uh, breakout sessions or uh, having uh, children uh, talk to one another. But I, I think that uh, that could that could really uh, help children who need peer interactions, social interactions, because I think what happened when this pandemic happened in March is uh, 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 the children were together for several months. So they got to know their peers in their classrooms and then everybody dispersed <laughs> and went home and quarantined and uh, it, it all changed. But the start of this school year, it's been very different. <laughs> it wasn't like you had that face-to-face uh, -face, uh, several months together where you got to know each other. Now mm -hmm. we just know each mm -hmm. other from maybe a little box on a screen and that might not seem like a real person to some kids who, um, that's hard. And I used to remember parents telling me, you know, I have a, my area is uh, exceptional education and I, uh, that's where I started in um, a resource room setting. And um, 
I remember a lot of parents of young children with special needs or disabilities would say, you know, inclusion is great, but my children still don't get invited to birthday parties. I My children are still not, you know, part of the community. Like we've been talking about community building. And I think that uh, we're going to hear a lot of parents probably talking about, you know, my children are in a virtual school and they're not getting invited to virtual birthday parties or, you know, these car parades or, you know, my, there's uh, friendships and friending someone on social media, but then there's also like meaningful back and forth that happens when you're face to face and you know somebody and you've been sitting next to them in a classroom and going out on the playground and playing with them and eating your lunch right next to them in the cafeteria. And I think for me, what I would love to see in lesson plans are purposefully designed opportunities in, in every lesson <laughs> where social interaction is somehow um, designed, where it's children are getting a chance to see each other uh, and talk to each other. Um, one of the other things that I would love to see in a lesson plan, and maybe this can't happen for every single lesson or every single day, uh, but uh, each child having an opportunity to talk to the teacher one-on-one -on -one individually. Yeah. One of the things uh, that my, I have a daughter who's uh, eight years old and she is in a virtual school and started off the school year and is currently in a virtual school. And once a week, her teacher uh, talks to her on the telephone. She uh, calls and is able to have a conversation with her teacher. And it seems like a small thing, but it means the world to us. And yeah. that time is just so precious when she can talk to her teacher and, and get to know her better. I also think that I've learned that if you could find a way to know something, find something positive about your about the child, bring the positive from the from outside into the classroom so that each child would feel valued and respected. You may have a child who maybe maybe you may feel a difficult child, a challenging child. But if, if you can take a deeper dive into the community, I know it's harder now, and find out something that that child is good at doing and make that child feel special and that you know his or her name and that you know something, what they're good at doing. And so I just feel very, very passionate about that. I know it's, it's hard in this, this climate, but I bet you we can find a virtual way of, of doing it. So the next question. Do, Dr. That, Stewart, um, I want to. Go ahead, Ms. Mary, go ahead. <laughs> I'm sorry. I just want to respond to Dr. Stewart. Um, is in my classroom, because I did that in my classroom at the beginning of the year, I, I had them fill out an index card, you know, with their name, their parents, email and that sort of thing. And then one thing that I had for them to write is this, what is one thing that you would like for me to know about you that no one wow. else, that you are afraid to tell everyone else? Wow. And so I have those cards and then wow. with the one-on-ones, I do have chats with my students. I call them data chats, but it's just really just to a check-in chat um, with my students because we are on a block schedule, we have 90 minutes. Um, in our classes. So I do, I have scheduled some time within there to talk to, you know, half the class on Monday, half the class on Thursday. Um, so everyone has a checkoff list. They have a checklist of things they have to do for that week. And one of those things on the checkoff list is to have a one-on-one with the teacher. And so um, I make sure that they do that. And I encourage my teachers when I'm coaching them that to have that within their suit with within their classrooms, because there are some t teachers who are having difficult, you know, with the behaviors and that sort of thing. So I said, you know, it's all about relationship building. You know, that's where it all comes back to where it's between the teachers and the students, you know, just like, you know, my mentor, she's gone on to be the Lord though, um, Rita Pearson. Um, she said, kids do not learn from teachers they don't like. And so, um, and so that I just use that as a, as a model for myself, you know, 
She said, every child needs a champion, and I try to be that champion for those students. Even to the fact they come to my classroom, even we don't have class on my coaching days, they, Ms. Bear, can we come to your class? I was like, but I have no, I have, I have to go have a meeting. Well, can you, can you come get us seventh, seventh period? Can we just come to your class and sit in your classroom seventh period? And I said, well, I said, one day I'm going to come get y'all. And then y'all, we can have a chat then. So, I mean, it's just that building that relationship with students that, you know, really and truly makes a difference because a lot of these students don't have that at home. You know, they don't have anybody um, supporting them, championing them. And so when they have that one teacher, they kind of stick with that teacher, you know, because they know that she's, or he, she or he has their back. I, I think to um, piggyback off of um, Ms. Barry, um, you know, having having those expectations for those kids too. I mean, because again, we don't know what's, you know, what they're coming from, but setting those those high expectations for them, no matter no matter where they are, but at the same time, you know, also modeling how to get there, showing them how to get there, showing them having the having the um, you know, even on the bad days, you know, still opening the lines of communication, being a model of being modeling those types of behaviors so that if no place else on the planet, they won't get, you know, what it actually looks like to be healthy or, or to be in a positive relationship um, with your peers, with adults. It's going to happen right here, you know, and, and establishing that community with, with the entire class. But again, you know, it's those you know, it's those sidebars. And I think to what Ms. Barry said, you know, no students aren't going to learn from you if they don't like you. And they really aren't going to learn from you if you embarrass them in front of their, your, their entire, you know, their entire classmates. So, you know, developing that sense of empathy both ways. There are plenty of days when I told my kids, listen, I just, I need some help today. And, and, you know, communicating that to them and, and, you know, they will respond. They have, you know, those expectations, you know, taking them step by step on how to get there all I think are really, really key um, and need to be, you know, you need to allot that time in there to really do that in those lesson plans, no matter what it is, you know, just allotting that time for that, for that growth, for that, for that question and answer, um, even though the, the pace of the curriculum is just insane, you know, but just having the wherewithal to really, really pull back, establish that relationship up front, um, because on the back end, you know, once the kids know that you are there and in their corner, you know, they will work and do wondrous things, you know, down the line that will surpass whatever your curriculum might have, you know, deems them to be, you know, this is where you need to be. So, I just wanted to kind of piggyback on, on that as well. I think both of your comments align with my next two questions, which I think I know how you all are going to answer. So the first question is, can SEL initiatives help a student improve their behavior? I feel like you're going to say yes. Okay. The next question is, how can SEL initiatives help my students grow academically? I feel like that's a yes for sure. So I want to extend both of those questions from can to how. How can SEL help students improve in their behavior? Um, or you might answer, how can SEL help students improve academically? Dr. Chapman, I was just going to piggyback on what Dr. Wade said because you made me remember a really funny story with being in a classroom of 13, 14, 15, 16 year old young men who were labeled. And one day, I, I, of course, I was in school too, so I had to ask them to help me with my homework. And one young man said to me, Help you with your homework? And I said, Yes, could you just help me with this homework? And uh, he said, Why do you have homework? I said, I go to school at night. And this is the best line I think I heard my whole career. He said, you go to school and your mother doesn't even make you. <laughs> and I thought, oh my gosh, I didn't even realize I was sharing something that would strike him as absolutely unusual because I, I, I was going to school, I had to go to school. So I think sometimes when we can be personal, we don't wanna to be too personal, We might be, but when we can say something about our lives that says, this is what I'm doing and, and this is what's keeping me afloat, 
that may be something some of the young people we work with don't have any experience or wouldn't recognize that as something that would be a good thing. And he was truly a, a challenging young man, twice my size. And after that, it was like, oh my God, she goes to school and her mother doesn't make her. He just thought that was the craziest darn thing. That's what he said to me. That's the craziest darn thing I've ever heard. But his behaviors changed. And with the change in the behavior, his academics improved. So I think sometimes we just, we're rolling the dice. We're not sure what's going to hit, but some things will hit. Dr. Lou Stewart, I think you're still on mute. Thank you. I think now, can you hear me? If, if used wisely, it can help us to bring structure to the classroom. Structure the classroom, including classroom rules, classroom management, classroom shared agreement. So, so many of the children and families that we work with and try to empower, don't necessarily have those structures uh, inside of the home. So again, about being the safety net, uh, helping us to provide some structure to their lives, I think could also help to improve the behaviors, uh, especially when, when there are SRO officers in, in the schools when that happens, we know it appears to be the the increase in suspension rates go up. I'm not throwing anybody on the bus, but I'm just saying that the need for structure in so many in our children's lives is not always there. And it's going to take the village to help them to help themselves. And I also think that how goes to, you know, how is it going to help the students? It's going to help their, their self-awareness. You know, it, how yes. it's going to help their self-management. You know, when things get difficult, you know, how, how do they manage that and what they're feeling? Um, their social awareness, being empathetic to others around, you know, others around them. You know, it's very much, it's very much a me, me, me type of mentality right now. So, you know, integrating some, some of these, some of these strategies and relationship building, um, you know, relationship building steps. Um, you know, is, is going to help is going to help that because when they get out into the real world, these are some of the things that they're really going to need. Um, you know, again, that relationship, the relationship and then, you know, the decision making, you know, all of those things, you know, by us trying to implement and 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 using this social emotional as a foundation for everything that we do. You know, again, like the group has said, you know, that that's how using these types of strategies is really going to have an impact because then, you know, once we've got the, them feeling well about what they can do, how to express, you know, um, when to express, how to be accepting of someone else who is completely different from them, you know, once they know how to do those things, then the engagement in the classroom becomes a different dynamic. Then you can get your discussions, you can get your small groups, you can have, you know, these meaningful things happen, knowing that some of these basic skills um, that 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 they're going to need to be successful in, in, in life, you know, mm -hmm. they have and can, you know, that's how that can kind of spill over into our academic side. Thank you so much, Dr. Wade, for really naming those characteristics that we're trying to develop with SEL. And Dr. Macy, I'm wondering how we can start developing those characteristics in younger children. Uh, thank you. Uh, one of the things I was thinking about uh, when Dr. Wade was talking about uh, self-awareness and helping children help themselves, predictable routines I think that that's an important thing, for, especially now more than ever with the pandemic and with children being in a, a lot of different settings, either virtual and remote or face-to-face -face or hybrid, uh, but being able to um, predict what's gonna happen throughout the day, being able to, to see your schedule, uh, visual schedules can be really helpful for kids to become self-managers uh, and, and knowing, what what comes first what comes second what's you know the middle of my day i think that that's those routines are so important to feeling safe and feeling in control of your environment and setting and i think that that can really help social emotional development in the early years and throughout 
uh, school age settings and with students. Um, in addition to predictable routines, the other thing I was thinking about was um, clear expectations for students, helping them understand what we expect, uh, the adults, uh, what they can expect from themselves and, and helping them uh, with expectations. I think that also leads to feeling safe, knowing mm -hmm. what people expect. What What is the expectation of this assignment? How is the teacher gonna evaluate me? or educator uh, that's uh, helping uh, me learn or develop in this area of social emotional, this domain that we're talking about today. But I think um, th those would be uh, two things that I was just kind of sitting here thinking about as we're talking and having this conversation about social emotional development and what, what we can do. I think those are great. And I also think they straddle the line of um, things educators can do and also things parents can do. Um, Dr. Lestour, earlier you mentioned the village. So let's talk about that. How can parents assist with developing um, or inputting SEL at home? A, a big issue now, especially with more and more families being at home, including persons, adult caregivers having to work at home. One of the challenges that I'm seeing is something called conflict resolution. Uh, just not enough space, it's not enough space. And that's a big part of what we're learning about SEL. If you learn how to resolve conflicts um, using your words rather than your fists and just talking things out, uh, having classroom meetings, where you have shared agreements. I've, I've seen that work and I think that could be very helpful. Remember, it's sometimes it says any child should lead them. Sometimes a child can learn things in the classroom and take it back to the family and say, grandma, mama, look what I learned today. I think that we'll have, um, we have educators who are watching, um, who teach in all different contexts. So do you have any specific um, strategies or suggestions for teachers who may be in rural or urban um, or high poverty settings when um, integrating SEL into their, their classroom? Mm -hmm. Where do we start? <laughs> we have so many, where do we start? May I just suggest yeah. that it is, is a good time now to get to know your teacher. Yeah. Your teacher really is your friend. Your, your teacher is your partner. Uh, if, you, if, if you've not had a positive relationship with the school, uh, now is the time to do so because you really do need to be on the same page. Um, I, if I'm if I'm reading the question correctly, and I think piggybacking off of what um, um, Dr. Um, Lou Stewart was 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 saying, you know, I think for me, the approach is is the same with all, with all my kids across the board. So it's nothing necessarily that I'm going to do any different. I'm going to learn a lot of different things from my students from the different areas. Um, so it's a big learning curve for me. Yes. Um, and, I, and I might curtail it that way, depending on where I am. Um, you know, again, being that model of, of what it is that we want our kids, our kids to be able to do. Um, so I don't, I wouldn't, I, I wouldn't change the approach regardless of where I am. Um, you know, I, and I, and I, I'm, I'm hoping I'm answering that question. Yeah, sure. I think you're answering it in a very profound way because what you're saying is get to know your kids, get yeah. to know your context, build those relationships. And it doesn't mm -hmm. matter if you're in a rural school, a suburban school, an urban mm -hmm. school, it mm -hmm. all starts with knowing who your students are and then adjusting mm -hmm. from there. Yeah. And, and I mean, and from that, again, that, you know, having that student input, you know, having the students problem solve, having that sense of partnership with the kids uh, and everybody in there, you know, having kids, you know, doing that self-assessment, they're having the higher level discussions, 
None of that can happen unless I know who I'm dealing with. Sense of partnership. I love yeah. that. Yeah. Knowing the yeah. village, knowing the village, knowing and the yes. village. Yes, mm -hmm. yes. And I love the question that you asked. It's a, a great question. It's um, uh, really looking at uh, resources within different communities. If you live in a rural, urban, uh, suburban community, uh, know the community that the child is in and be a connector. Help the child and their family connect uh, to what they need. Um, for example, maybe uh, the parent comes and picks up the child and says, "You know, I I think I might I think I might have gotten COVID, uh, but I don't know what to do next." Maybe a another parent told you the day before that there's a pop up uh, uh, testing going on in the 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 playground parking lot, the parking lot of the school, and they can go and get a, a free test and find out if they have it or not. But just knowing what the resources are in our community and connecting families and children to what they might need. Maybe they, they need to see a dentist and uh, you know we might know of a, de a dentist or there's a school nurse or somebody that can connect them to a service or an opportunity or a resource that the family could really benefit from. Mm -hmm. uh, sometimes I, I think, you know, we can, you know, we, we wear, I think somebody said it earlier, we wear a lot of different hats and, you know, I might be an educator and a, a teacher, uh, but I can also be a matchmaker for this family and this child to what I know is going on in the community that they might be able to find helpful. So it's kind of like going beyond the lesson plan, beyond, <laughs> beyond the classroom, beyond the virtual classroom or the face-to-face -face classroom. Yeah. It's knowing, it's being a human and knowing what other humans need and want and uh, knowing how, how I can maybe be helpful. Yeah. Excellent. I think we could. Oh, and go I'm ahead. Just Barry, wrap it up. Is I'm right. I'm trying to wrap it up. Um, is to just have that open line of communication with your parents. Um, is just you know reaching out to your parents, whether it's a phone call. The phone calls make such a huge difference um, in the lives of that parent because that parent could be going through something or whatever at home, but by being a teacher and reaching out, you turn into a counselor, you turn into that shoulder to cry on um, for that parent. So it's important to start building those relationships, not just with the students, but with those parents as well. And and to just you know say that your child is doing well, not all the negative stuff, but call them saying that your child is doing doing well in school, you know, uh, focus on the positive things. Um, so that way you are building that partnership um, with your parents and also your community as well um, in turn. Thank you all so much um, for being here. We're going to go ahead and wrap up for the sake of time. I'm sure that we could go on talk having this conversation for a while, we might even be able to rename it a uh, humanizing education because I heard that come up a couple of times. So thank you panelists for your time um, and for your expertise. And thank you all for participating and watching and submitting your questions. If we weren't able to address your question tonight, you can submit it to tjeei at ucf.edu and we'll be sure to find an answer for you. Also, please um, follow us on Facebook and Twitter, like and share the videos. We're on YouTube as well. And last, join us next week for our final conversation on universal design for learning. Thank you again and have a great evening.